Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about acute respiratory failure. A thorough understanding of the physiologic aspects of the respiratory system is essential for understanding the clinical manifestations, complications, and treatment of acute respiratory failure. The system is important in helping to meet its need for oxygenation and tissue perfusion because the source of oxygen for all body cells is the air we breathe. Air with oxygen enters the nose and mouth and moves through the airway or respiratory tubes known as the trachea, bronchi, and bronchioles, and into the air sacs also known as alveoli of the lungs. Once in the alveoli, the air moves into the blood so that it can be carried to all tissues and organs. The waste gas created in the tissue known as carbon dioxide moves from the blood into the alveoli so it can be removed through exhalation. When acute respiratory failure occurs, there are two problems with this gas exchange. Number one, hypoxia, in which inadequate oxygen is being transferred. And number two, hypercapnia, in which the client is retaining too much carbon dioxide. Acute respiratory failure can be classified as hypoxemia or hypercapnia. The definition of hypoxemic respiratory failure is commonly defined as the partial pressure of arterial oxygen less than 60 mmHg. This may also be known as gas exchange failure. Disorders such as pneumonia, pulmonary edema, pulmonary embolism, and heart failure are examples of potential alteration that can develop into acute respiratory failure. The primary problem in hypercapnia respiratory failure is insufficient carbon dioxide removal. As the partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide is greater than 45 mmHg, otherwise known as the ventilatory failure, the client is unable to effectively remove carbon dioxide. Disorders that compromise carbon dioxide removal are drug overdoses with CNS depression like heroin overdoses, neuromuscular disease, acute asthma, COPD exacerbation, chest trauma, higher spinal cord injury that play a role in a respiratory muscle innervation. The respiratory system depends on adequate respiratory movements to exhale carbon dioxide and inhale oxygen. In adequate respiratory failure, the partial pressure of arterial oxygen is less than 60 mmHg. The gas exchange has been impaired which consequently impacts all tissue and organ functions. The cause of acute respiratory failure can be due to Obstruction It is when something lodges in your throat. You may have trouble getting enough oxygen in your lungs. Injury An injury that impairs or compromises your respiratory system can adversely affect the amount of oxygen in your body. Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome It is a serious condition characterized by low oxygen in the blood. Drug or Alcohol Use If you overdose on drugs or drinks too much alcohol, you can impair brain function and hinder your ability to breathe in or exhale. Chemical Inhalation Inhaling toxic chemicals, smoke, or fumes can also cause acute respiratory failure. These chemicals may inquire or damage the tissues of your lungs, including air sacs and capillaries. Infection Infection are common cause of respiratory distress. Pneumonia in particular are most cause of respiratory failure. Inflammation, as seen in anaphylaxis. Inadequate muscle support for ventilation, as seen in neuromuscular diseases such as ALS. It is also important to discuss the gerontological consideration of respiratory failure. Older adults have an increased risk of respiratory failure due to reduction in the ventilator capacity, decreased muscle strength, and delayed responses in respirate in depth, in particular fall in the following partial pressure of arterial oxygen and partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide. Clients in acute respiratory failure will present the signs and symptoms of hypoxemia and hypercapnia. Clients will have a change in level of consciousness by exhibiting restlessness, confusion, anxiety, and lethargy.
Other signs and symptoms include tachycardia due to lack of oxygen profusion to tissues and organs, tachypnea if hypoxemic, or bradypnea if the client has respiratory depression or ineffective respiratory muscles to exhale carbon dioxide. The client more likely feel more comfortable sitting upright due to oxygen demand such as orthopnea. And lastly, hypertension. This indicates the body's response to the increased rate for oxygenated blood flowing to the tissues. These clinical manifestations that I've just indicated are urgent need to provide supplemental oxygen support. Respiratory distress without intervention will produce profound changes in clients to include a change from a rapid respiratory rate that slows suggesting a progression of respiratory muscle fatigue. This increases the probability of respiratory arrest and subsequent cardiac arrhythmias. Signs of deterioration include positioning of clients, inability to speak, muscle retraction like using shoulders, breathing itself will be harder, and bronchial sounds. Using your assessment skill will be essential in determining the early stage of respiratory failure that could possibly lead into respiratory arrest. Laboratory and diagnostic data assist the healthcare team in determining the severity of hypoxemia and underlying cause. An arterial blood gas determines the pH partial pressure of arterial oxygen in carbon dioxide and bicarbonate. This determines the extent of hypoxemia in the course of action. Also, a complete blood count to determine a potential cause. For example, an elevated white blood cell count could indicate an infection like pneumonia. A comprehensive metabolic panel, otherwise known as CMP, to determine electrolyte imbalances and kidney function. And also a sputum culture will assist in determining the underlying microorganism for antibiotic therapy in particular if the patient has a productive cough. Blood culture will also be needed and assist if there is systemic infection and if you're suspecting that some sort of antibiotic therapy would be warranted. And also lastly, the electrocardiogram, also known as EKG, if the patient has any underlying cardiac issues. The plan for this client is to maintain adequate oxygenation and ventilation. Tissue hypoxia from inadequate oxygenation will ultimately lead to death. The primary intervention is to provide oxygen therapy for any patient who has acute respiratory failure. Mobilization of pulmonary secretion will increase the ability for gas exchange. This includes encouraging the client to cough in deep breath, adequate hydration and humidification to replace fluid loss, moisturizes the passageway, postural drainage by capping the hand and clapping the back, suctioning for any loose secretions, and lastly, breathing exercise, such as the use of burst lip breathing. Also, by sitting up in an upright position, this may help the client find a more comfortable position that allows easier breathing. Then assist client with relaxation breathing technique to decrease anxiety that occurs with feeling short of breath. Medication therapy can also be included in this, such as the bronchial dilators to open up the airways, corticosteroids to decrease inflammation, diuretics and nitroglycerin or opioids to decrease pulmonary congestion, antibiotics for infection and sedation, analgesics to decrease anxiety, agitation, and pain. These are all specific sort of intervention that can help the patient to an acute respiratory failure. If any of these interventions have not improved adequate oxygenation and ventilation, more invasive measures are warranted, such as the mechanical ventilation. Positive pressure ventilation may be necessary to include the endotracheal intubation. Endotracheal intubation is a medical procedure in which a tube is placed into the windpipe or in the trachea. This forms an open passage in the upper airways of the patient to be able to ventilate the lungs. The air must be free to enter and exit the lungs. Thus, patient is connected to the mechanical ventilator to provide continuous respiration.
and also a tracheostomy to deliver oxygen if the patient's airways are blocked. This is a surgically made hole that goes through the front of the neck and into the windpipe. This is placed in the hole to help the patient breathe. Thus, patient is connected to the mechanical ventilator to provide continuous respiration. The nursing diagnosis for acute respiratory failure is infective breathing pattern related to hypoxia as evidenced by shortness of breath and ineffective airway clearance related to excessive secretions, presence of artificial airway and pain as evidenced by difficulty in expectorating, sputum ineffective or absent of cough. Younger patients less than 60 years old have better survival rate than older patients. Acute respiratory failure is associated with poor prognosis, but advances in mechanical ventilation and airway management have improved prognosis. It depends on the underlying cause of the respiratory failure. The overall goals of therapy for the client is adequate oxygenation and ventilation. The overall goals of therapy for the client is to have adequate oxygenation and ventilation by decreasing the work of breathing gas exchange improvement with data from an arterial blood gas that is within the normal or trending towards normal. Breath sounds clear on improving oxygen saturation equal to or than 92 or 93 percent and the client can speak in full sentences with returning to baseline function. These are all the desired outcomes. That would be all. Thank you for listening.